welcome to the Cathedral of Shadows, where demons gather. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Cathedral of Shadows and Megami Tensei Podcast. I'm Rosin. I'm Katsu. And I'm Frequency, and I'm the guest for today, I guess. Yes, you are. And do you want to wanna tell us your uh, claim to oh, fame I as of late? Uh, <laughs> sure. Um, I've been working on a translation for Shin Megami Tensei Devil Summoner, the prequel to Soul Hackers. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. Awesome stuff. So, uh... I guess we have a little bit of news that uh, we, we should address first, that um, a lot of Persona fans specifically have been getting pretty pretty uptight pretty, about it. Pretty heated, to yeah. say the least. Well, there's always heat going on in the Mega Ten fan stuff, but yeah. especially lately with the DLC shenanigans and whatnot. Oh my but... god, 2014 just seems like an awful year to be a Mega Ten <laughs> fan. It's, it's shaping like... up to... It's, it's shaping like up to be the worst, worst year, but we're getting the most Mega Ten gains. What is going on? Yeah, it's crazy like that. Um, okay, so I guess three characters have gotten new voices uh, for Ultimax and Q, with um, Theodore being the first, and I I should have looked this up beforehand. I do not know the new person for that. All right. Uh, well, we don't know about Ultimax yet, but for at oh. least for Q. We don't well, know about he... Ultimax yet since, like, Ultimax was done months in advance like months in advance before they even announced a release date okay so, we <laughs> don't know we don't know about ultimax yet except for the exception of yeah, two. no so i think i think i think uh kanji with that too is um, i don't even i don't even know Did, i think i think theo might be i think you're right theo is only q and i think um ultimax and q i think ultimax is just i think ultimax and q is just now too we oh. don't know about uh <laughs> Kanji and Ultimax. Anyway. Anyways, yeah, so moving on. Then a later, little Naoto, bit later, we got Naoto, Naoto changing. Naoto, Kanji, Theodore, and Margaret are going to have new voice actors. Oh, I forgot uh, about Margaret, yeah. So people have been freaking out about that. And Naoto is being voiced by Valerie Aram. She does the... Um, she's the voice director for most of the Mega Ten games. Yeah, like SMT4, she was the uh, voice casting person for that. Oh, yeah, actually... She, I, I just finished Persona 2, and I saw her name in the credits with her husband, I think it is. Oh, geez. Was that Instant Sin or Eternal Punishment? Like, uh, Well, they have, don't have Internal Punishment in English, so it probably wouldn't be her. But, um, uh, yeah, it was Innocent Sin. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Punishment. They just had the... Yeah. Um, she's done a lot of... She's done most of the recent Mega Ten work. <laughs> I didn't know she... Uh, I think even back. I think before, did, like, Nocturne. And, yeah, I think, I think before Nocturne, they just kind of outsourced to Bang Zoom. And back when Bang Zoom used to do video games, they don't do that anymore. <laughs> right. Um. Yeah. So she's been working on Atlas dubs for quite some time, and yeah, she decided to take over as Naoto. Her previous actress couldn't do it anymore for some reason, and so she decided <laughs> to step in. This is like the fourth person we have voicing Naoto now, right? The or third it... person. Third okay. Year. okay. The anime was done by uh, Mary Elizabeth McGlynn. She's, if you oh. don't know, she's she's the major and uh, Ghost, Ghost in the Shell. Shell. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, I, and a lot of people are like freaking out saying, "Oh no, the new voices are going to be terrible." But like we've and, seen, like, we we've heard new Naoto. She sounds exactly the same as the old. <laughs> I voice. know. I like, didn't even notice. <laughs> I, really I, didn't I haven't notice. heard much of it. Yeah, I, I didn't notice until like. People said started yeah, saying stuff until like the Atlas guys who were streaming said, "Oh yeah, we heard. Oh yeah, Naoto got a new actress." And they're like, "Oh yeah, really? Let's play as her." And then they started using her. She was all, she said some of the new lines. Like, I think I think they mixed in some of the old lines with the new lines. But right. when you yeah. hear her say stuff like blight and volley and moving out and stuff like that, it's the new voice and it sounds exactly I think, like the old one. I think she had this the new voice for like the, the one line that I remember was they were playing as her and like she went sniping and then you heard that voice. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's the new voice. That was a good so <laughs> Yeah, that stream was kinda of fun. 
aside from the stream chat. Oh, well, yeah, the chat's always terrible, though. That's just fucking... <laughs> Didn't um, they have two streams? One during E3 and, like, one after that? Yeah. They, the like, the yeah. one recently was the, uh... Or, like, they played There's as... There's one on Twitch. Stuff. Yeah. They just played as Teddy and show for, like, ten matches. <laughs> oh, man. I'm fine because those are the two characters that interest me the most, so I lucked out. I'm like, fuck yeah, these are the two characters I probably want to play, so... One thing I'm curious about is how come they haven't had Adachi in any of them yet? Like, I get that it's not because the same he's, build. Because but... he's DLC... Probably. And, right. Okay, but still, like I mean, they put it out in I would, a while ago. So I would not be shocked if he just isn't fucking done for the English version yet, and they don't want to show it off or something. Because uh, well, Johnny asking. Well, Johnny said he he was done recording Adachi. Well, they might have finished the lines, but they haven't done any other. Oh stuff yeah, they haven't that. done. They yeah, haven't done like QA testing and making make sure, sure that they all Adachi, play at the right time. Yeah, yeah. making sure Adachi doesn't destroy the game when he's like put into English build. Because you know that happens with That happened with uh Relius and Blaze Blue, like when uh not Relius but Valkenhine in the Xbox three sixty version of uh Continuum Shift, he kinda like broke the game. I was so... thinking of Street Fighter Cross Tech and with fucking there was that one patch that every time Ronaldo's knife hit a projectile the game just crashed. Like yeah, there's, there's a lot of minute shit in fighting games like that where if something's coded wrong it just breaks the entire thing. So but anyway, moving on. Um when we learned that Naoto got a new actress, not too long afterwards, we got news that Theodore was gonna have a new actor. And Theodore's new actor is Bryce Papenbrook. And for those who don't know, Bryce is the voice of Asbel Lant and Tales of Graces F. He's Isakar and Shin Megami Tensei four. He's June in Persona 2 Innocent Sin. Uh, and you barely hear any of him in that game. Yeah. yeah. So that doesn't really count. Um, he's Zidane in Dissidia Duodecim. Uh, yeah. He does a lot of like kid voices, like teenager and kid voices. So it's kind, kind of, of weird. soft, yeah. uh, respectful voice. Yeah, really fucking weird for him to be cast as Theo then. Yeah, because Theo's old actor was uh, <laughs> Travis Willingham. Who he, was, was Lord... he was like a gruffer, maybe not gruff, but like a deeper, more yeah. elderly voice almost. Um, yeah, Travis. Will... for those who don't know, Travis Willingham is Laura Bailey's husband. Laura Bailey voices Rise. So. Yeah, but you got to think of the Japanese voice actor too, because Theo's voice in Japanese is kind of like, I mean, I don't know how to describe it really, but... Um, it's it's very polite, like all of the people who are in the velvet room, obviously. Yeah. But it's it's pretty soft, I think. Yeah. Um, Even if it is deeper, it's still very like light when you hear it. It'll be interesting to have a new take on the character, at least. Yeah. And the last one that we got was uh. And the best one. The best one that everyone's like flipping their shit over is that uh, Kanji got a new voice, oh, sort of. Right. Matthew Mercer is taking over as Kanji for a Persona well, he already Q. Did it once. Yeah, yeah, he already did it once for the anime back when uh, Troy Baker he couldn't uh, voice Kanji for the second half of the anime because he got married and he was on his honeymoon. So there's that. Right. Anyway, <laughs> behold so, my personas. Yeah, pretty much. So Matthew Mercer is now taking over as Kanji. I don't see why people are freaking out since Mercer and Baker sound exactly the same. It sounded really I mean, sick. Troy Baker was good. Like, he was very good at it. But, um, yeah. you know, I don't think Mercer is nearly as bad as some people make him out to be. I really like nah. Mercer. Like, I think he gets a lot of shit, Mercer, but, like, fucking Mercer's he's a really, on Walter. Yeah, Mercer's a really cool guy. Like, he plays all the games that he voices in. Yeah. So he's going to be playing Persona Q. <laughs> oh, um, man. And I really don't think that Mercer's just, like, the permanent kanji because well, he's not going to show up in any other game so let's think about that yeah <laughs> let's be serious yeah um, unless like kanji appears in persona 4 dance i don't think that uh mercer didn't they have like... his name on the list for that game for dance yeah we don't even know what kanji's in dance i'm just like for example because yeah we don't, we don't even know who else is going to be in dance aside from like narikami and rise no they they did they had in the trailer they said like these characters and more Oh, oh, yeah. Like, there was a list yeah. of Chie and Naoto, and I think Kanji was on there. Oh, all right. Um, so, like, the whole thing with Persona Q and the voice acting is... Oh, yeah, we forgot about Margaret's actress. Uh, Margaret's actress has uh, family issues that she has to take care of, so she right. can't make it. Yeah, So, anyway, 
It's unfortunate, but yeah. Only anyway. voice actor from my uh, my state of Wisconsin, so Wisconsin yeah. people need to stick up for each other. You'll be missed, Margaret. Yes. So the whole thing just leads me to believe that the entire the timing of the dub is just really bad. <laughs> well, because they probably want to get it out as fast as possible in English, and like yeah. sometimes people's schedules, especially voice actors, because especially with the uh, English stuff, there's not too many of them. That are like yeah, really, really not, good. Like there's not too many of them that are willing to do these kinds of projects. So there's that, and it is the fact that guys like Troy Baker and Travis Willingham, they're really busy people. They got tons yeah. of games that they're working on right now. I mean, Troy Baker's probably doing Far Cry three. I mean, not or Far Cry four. three, or four. Uh, Travis Willingham probably has project that he projects that he's working on, and it's just extremely busy. Cause it's not like Willingham just suddenly went union or anything. He's he's he was the voice of Relius in uh, okay. Chrono Phantasma. He's Gaius in uh, Tales of Exilia. So it, it just seems like it was a bad call. Yeah, like. I, I to be to be fair, I think I'd rather have the game out sooner with new voices rather than just wait forever for those people to finally be able to record. But it's, it's just kind of shitty that it had to be that way, I guess. But I mean, even then, I'm I'm glad with the new choices. Like, there's nothing that I'm super offended by, and I think a lot of people are jumping the gun with getting angry because let's be honest, we haven't really given the new choice like the new voice actors a chance yet, so. Hey, the Naoto one sounds perfectly fine. So it does. does. So does Kanji. From what like, we've heard so far, yeah. Yeah, like nothing's changed with those two. I'm just a little <laughs> iffy on Theodore choice that because that just seems really odd to me. It's like Bryce usually does like the teenage boys in anime. <clears throat> like he's Kurito and freaking Sword Art Online. So oh it's, man, boggles the mind. Anyway, all right. So I, just I guess hear what he sounds like. Yeah, yeah. So I guess we should move on to our main main thing that I'm sure everyone's drooling over while we just talked about voice actors for good 10 minutes probably. So, Frequency, our good friend here, you have quite the project that has made everyone that's heard about it pretty excited. So, um, oh man, I guess the easiest way to go through this is, uh, let's, uh, let's go back a ways. How did you first get into Megami Tensei in general? Well, um, let's see. I guess it was about, what you, what year is it? 2014 so about i guess three or four years ago a friend of mine in school said if i or asked if i had ever played persona 4 persona 3 and of course i I didn't i hadn't heard of them um and at some point i guess on my psp um i tried persona 3 portable because that was just the one that i had at the time i didn't have a ps2 anymore i mean i I used to have a ps2 but got stolen from me at some point um so I played Persona 3 on the PSP, and, you know, I, people say today that you should play um, Fest before you try doing that because of the 3D scenes and all that, but I hadn't even heard of it before then, so I, I didn't know that. Yeah. But, um, so I gave it a shot, thought it was pretty fun, um, thought the characterization was all right, um, just seemed like a fun RPG series, and so I went and looked up what the other ones in the, in the Persona series were first, and then into what the larger series was overall. That's about it. Awesome stuff. So uh, yeah, you've been you've been fan for a little little longer than I have. Then I'm I'm still kind of an SMT baby. Like so I guess tabby. I guess two and a half years, whatever. Um, but yeah. So I guess did you do the thing that everyone seems to do, where as soon as you learn about the entire franchise, you buy as much as possible and then start all of them, then never get around to finishing a majority. Hmm. Seems uh, well, to be a common Mega Ten thing. <laughs> first i think since i had started on the psp i played the other ones that were on the psp so like i played two and i played one and then after that uh, i think i tried rido next i think it was the first rido game that i tried after that um but yeah there wasn't really a pattern to it or anything i didn't try to do all of them at once but i there were definitely some points where i, I kind of dropped one for a while yeah like i i tried playing devil survivor once i just i couldn't get into it yeah, Devil Survivor 1 is just... It is one of those games where it's an acquired taste at first, and then once you get into it, it's it's pretty fun. I know I know, I know, know that you dropped Devil Survivor 1 before Rosin. Well, that's because I didn't know what the fuck Megami Tensei was, and I was playing it on emulator, and I was a dumb kid. 
and I was like, this game's too hard, it's dumb, and then, yeah. Later I like the story, later but on, it's just the gameplay was not really my sort of thing. It's a little rough around the edges, I find, Devil Survivor 1. Um, even Overclocked has a few issues, I find. Maybe it's because even, I played 2 first, but... Even maybe. Ogreclocked. Yes. Oh, man. So, I guess... So let's talk about the game in question. Yeah, so... Well, I guess, how'd you get involved with the uh, Devil Summoner 1, this translation that you've been working on for, you said, like a year now? Yeah, it's been about a year, um, okay. me and the other translator. Um, basically, on uh, SMTG, the 4chan board for this, um, for a long time, there's been a lot of clamoring for, particularly uh, if um, Persona 2 Eternal Punishment on the PSP, um, maybe... Uh, uh, the first two Me- Megami Tensei games, Majin Tensei, um, pretty much any any game that hasn't been officially localized at one point or another. So, uh, but after Soul Hackers came out, um, I sort of saw it and went, well, you know, there's there's all these characters in here and things that it references that people just aren't gonna get. And so, since I- interest sort of sparked more in that, I that's that's kind of why I went for this game over say any others, I guess. Also, the script was out there, so that certainly helped. Oh, that yeah, that must have made it a lot easier to yeah. track stuff down. Yeah. Um, do you find that Devil Summoner... Because uh, one thing I hear a lot about Soul Hackers is people really like it because that game, even compared to other Mega Ten stuff, it has personality behind it. Do you think sure. that holds true for the first one, too? Well, the thing about Soul Hackers, and this is true, I think, of Persona 2, 1, and the first Devil Summoner game, too, um, a lot of the same people worked on them, and they had kind of a different... Um, I don't know if the composer was all of the same for them... Um, at least in the um, PlayStation 1 games, anyway. Um, but there was a kind of aesthetic to it that I think that just that doesn't necessarily get conveyed as well in the other Mega Ten games. So, like, for example, you know, p- people criticize Persona 3 and 4 a lot for being maybe like too modern anime, or criticize maybe Digital Devil Saga for being, I don't know, too pretentious or something. But Too edgy uh, for me. No, I mean, w- whatever they want to say about it. But... Um, Devil Summoner, I think, is kind of unique in that, for the most part, it's not that crazy outside of the actual demon-related stuff. So, like, most of the game that I, that I, as far as I can tell, anyway, is is just kind of you talking to people and going around a relatively normal world. Um, now, of course, there are the summoners and stuff about, but sort of in the same way that the Raido games are not entirely false representation of, say, Taisho Japan, I would say that the first Devil Summoner is a, is a not totally unfair representation of, say, 90s Japan. For example, there's a reference in, I think, a pretty early part of the game where you go to, like, the sort of big arcade district, which is called uh, Yarai Ginza, um, and it's sort of in the middle of just the just the main city area and there's a coin locker that you go and open and a, f- a few different things can happen but one of the um results is that you find uh well the protagonist thinks it thinks it's a baby at first that someone left in the locker <laughs> but his his line after that it says well you oh, know wow. if i think about it i guess it kind of looks like a cupid doll and so this is kind of a reference to how in the 80s and 90s there was a couple incidences of people leaving babies in coin lockers uh ah. In uh, wow. Japan, and, like they talk about, I mean, this is just some random NPC dialogue, but like they say, oh, what was it? It was some kind of like band. Is the Morlock something circus? I can't remember what it is, but it was, it was, it was some reference to a, a, a band, and they were saying like, oh, isn't one of their members dead? And it's like, oh, well, they're still gonna make a comeback tour. It was just kind of like odd dialogue that you would probably get if you lived in Japan at that time. So what I learned from that is that instead of calling people dumpster babies like I tend to do when I'm angry, I'm going to start calling them coin dumps, dumpster babies. Um, <laughs> but anyways, that, that's actually really cool because, um, see, the, the thing that's weird about a lot of Mega Ten spinoffs I find from that era, especially stuff like, well, I guess even Devil Survivor 1 has this to an extent, it seems like a lot of the, uh, a lot of the spinoffs with that first entry, they kind of have... Uh, a bit of a struggle trying to find their own identity like yeah you can feel the mainline influence pretty hard even with persona it's, one yeah, there's, a oh, lot yeah, of, persona one, definitely, there's definitely a lot of mainline influence like the, the fact to just alone that every character has both a melee weapon and a gun is yeah. is very in is very indicative of that i mean I, I actually think i actually like that mechanic a lot but i think it's indicative of where it comes from just sort of gameplay wise 
But in, in my in my mind, the main thing about Devil Summoner is, you know, this this isn't as clear in the, the Rido games, I don't think. But at least in Devil Summoner One, one of the issues I sort of had was there's a, there's a lot of Chinese stuff in it. Like for example, in the main town, there's a, a Chinatown area, and the person who gives you quests throughout the whole game is supposedly a good friend of the guy who's in charge of Chinatown. I don't know what they mean by that, but there's a guy who owns a restaurant or something. Um, and the quest giver, who's a fortune teller, um, is apparently a good friend of his. And a lot of the weapon and armor stuff is um, Chinese influenced, and a lot of the bosses you face and stuff. So there, and I, th I think it's even said. And I, I I haven't read the Rido novels, but the original um, Kyoji, who's the uh, protagonist of this game. Well, I mean, he's not technically the protagonist, but because his body gets inhabited by someone else. I mean, it's a complicated story. You can all read it there, but. Um, Basically, it's it's implied that uh, his family was originally Chinese, and they were conquered by like a Japanese dynasty in ancient times. And then after that, they sort of got roped into doing the dirty work of the Kusunoha families. And so that's sort of where Devil Summoner picks up, I think. Which is pretty cool, because like Kusunoha is kind of this sort of badass, almost like a meme-ish sort of thing within the Mega Ten community with anyone who's related to the yeah. Kuzanoas in any way, shape, or form. They're just automatic badasses. So that's that's always good to see. Little origin stuff like that. Kuzanoha even shows up in Persona 2. Right. So th that's that's been an issue of contention for a while, I think, because people... <laughs> first, first people weren't sure if it was actually the same character because it didn't say it as much in the game. But if you look at the art book, and the art book's only in Japanese, sadly, but... Uh, in the art book, it, it explains that um, the person who is playing the role of uh, Daisuke Todoroki in the Kuzunoha de de Detective Agency in Persona 2 is uh, Kyoji from Devil Summoner 1. Wow. And, well, I mean, yeah. So because his soul gets it gets lost out of his body because <laughs> um, of a spell cast on him by uh, another summoner, and so he ends up having to sort of jump between bodies. So in Soul Hackers, he's uh, the man in the purple suit. Skiroku. It's kind of hard to say his name, but um, he's the, that character in that. And then Devil Summoner 1, he's in the body of... Uh, well, after he gets ejected out of his own body, he's in the body of this uh, Yakuza thug. And he has kind of a hard time in that. And he says at the end of that that he'll be changing to a different body. <laughs> so then that's why in, in Soul Hackers, he's, he's that character. Yeah, which, uh, I mean, I guess people that have listened to this podcast for a while know I'm a big timeline nut. So, like, just hearing all the stuff that we've kind of missed out on as English fans just within Devil Summoner 1, pretty exciting for me personally because, it's I don't kinda, know. It's kind of proving that le it's kind of proving at least the, uh, the Devil Summoner aspect of the timeline is mostly correct. Yeah. Well, it's not so but... much that it's mostly correct. It has, it has a lot of sort of name drops from other games. So, for example... Um, I, don't, I haven't finished If, so I don't know if this is clearly explained in that, but at the beginning of, well, it, it doesn't say it all at the beginning, but throughout the game of Devil Summoner, it explains that key characters from Shin Megami Tensei 1, like uh, Goto or Thorman, are either dead or unable to do what they did in that game, which is sort of what caused the events of that game to go on. So, for example, if anyone who's listening has played Shin Megami Tensei 1, they know that uh, Goto of the self defense forces um, initiated a revolution, and yep. um, sort of th through through that up, and then the American ambassador was able to um, get what well, the wording they use is that they that he convinced the American government that they had to contain the violence in Tokyo, so he got them to launch missiles, and Thanks that kind of blew blew the whole thing up. Um, but the explanation for this in Devil Summoner One is that. Um, Colonel Goto, and this was uh, this is a kind of a side note, but the rank that Goto is it was kind of an issue of argument on SMTG for a while. But I went and talked to some of the Aeon, the Aeon Genesis guys in their IRC chat, and we sort of looked at some of the Japanese sources, which listed his rank as um, what was it? It's called Ito Rikusa, which in English is uh, the the equivalent rank of Colonel. And I, I sort of looked into this for a little while longer, and it seems like both in the first game and in Devil Summoner, he's the same rank. So it's not like in Shin Megami Tensei 1, he was some really high rank, and so he was really successful. And then in Devil Summoner, he was way way lower rank and then wasn't successful. But he was the same rank in both games. And it just for, for, for some other reason, 
Um, the military police discovered him hoarding the weapons and rifles and pistols and stuff, and that he was planning all that. And they <laughs> put him under arrest. And See? as for the yeah, as, as as for the ambassador, he ended up uh, dying of heart failure. Um, and uh, the missile launch thing still kind of happened, but it was noted that. Um, a, an American missile base in Arizona misfired, but it's, they still didn't know what it was that caused it. See, guys, timeline bullshit. All like this stuff always happens in Mega Ten. So why don't see why you guys were complaining about Persona Q? <laughs> I'm still seeing comments about that, and I'm so surprised. Well, that's a little bit different, admittedly, because the whole t- timeline it's... branch thing is is um, kind of it, it's it's explained by some things that happen in If, whereas Persona Q just kind of occurs. Yeah, that's true. Like, there's a bit more, uh, I guess, cohesiveness with all that. Um, but yeah, so basically, it kind of proves that Devil Summoner Persona probably that's almost probably. 100% guaranteed to be in one singular timeline then. And also the Great Destruction just doesn't fucking happen. There's <laughs> some iffiness about it still, though, because it's said that Soul Hackers takes place three years after Devil Summoner 1, which is in 1996. And both Devil Summoner 1 and Persona 1 take place in 1996. But if since since Persona 2 takes place in 1999 and Soul Hackers takes place in 1999... It's sort of unclear what happens when, because obviously Kyoji can't be two characters at the same time. Yeah, yeah, so. that's that, that's weird timing, because I think both Persona 2, actually I don't quite know on Persona 2, but I think Soul Hackers is stated to take place early summer. Yeah, see, that, that's, that's and, the part I'm not too Persona, sure about. In Persona 2, they are wearing the winter uniforms. Right, now that, that, was, that was one thing I noticed, but then any student you run into in Soul Hackers is also wearing fall winter, winter uniform, so... It's weird. <laughs> yeah, in other words, I mean, Kyoji is a busy also, man. There's also the fact that, you know, Innocent Sin, the entire universe just kind of dies and then gets rebooted and then Eternal Punishment well, It doesn't happens. get re- rebooted. They make a new yeah. sort of parallel make a new, world. Make a new world with Blackjack and hookers so Philemon can live in peace. Yeah. Um, oh, man. But th- that's actually uh, one thing that a lot of people have trouble with with timeline stuff, too, is that... Actually, that's a big reason a lot of people want these games to be um, translated, too, I think, is there's a lot of people that really just like learning more about the series in general in terms of a timeline perspective, and it's kind of hard going off of word of mouth with a lot of stuff. Like, um, right. Actually, this is a good transition point. Speaking of word of mouth, you uh, you uh, shattered some uh, misconceptions people had about Devil no. Summoner PSP. Want to get into that a little bit? Well, okay, I don't, I don't know if I would say shattered, but basically there was a rumor for a long while that um, Devil Summoner 1 wasn't localized in the first place because Atlas lost the source code or something. But, uh, you know, every time someone brought that up, I asked them if they had any kind of evidence for it, and no one has... I To this day, I've never seen any evidence for that to actually be true. And, frankly, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but... If it were true, you'd think there'd be like a interview or something somewhere that said it. Um, and the second thing is that uh, some people said that the PSP version was emulating the Saturn version, and therefore um, I, it either wasn't worth it to try to do the PSP version, or that um, like it would be too hard to do it because it was just emulating something and it, it just would, wouldn't make a difference or whatever it was. But that, I mean, there's definitely. I mean, I, I don't know the programming side of it, but from what I've heard from other people, it seems like there's definitely a whole bunch of like fragmentation issues with the coding of it, um, because it is still a Saturn port game. So, even but they but they've added new features. The load times are much better because if you've if if anyone's even seen the Saturn version, the load times even just for a, a common battle are ridiculous, because um, you just it, you it. It triggers the random encounter, and it takes maybe a good three seconds for the enemies to show up on the screen. Like it is unbearable. Um, so yeah, if th- those two things are at least not true. And um, I think part of this was actually aided with that. Uh, I guess people that want to see or mess around with uh, Devil Summoner PSP. I mean, even I did this. Uh, you can just download the ISO or something, which people tend to do if they're interested in Mega Ten stuff. Like hell, I have all the Mega Ten games, even if they're in Japanese, just to mess around with. I've played around with them and stuff. Uh, Devil Summoner One does not emulate very well unless you're on actual hardware. Right? No, that, yeah, that's um, people. I think mentioned most importantly, at one point it just didn't work at all. 
Um, and after it sort of started to work properly, the main issue now is either the music doesn't work all the time. Like there's some channel missing on the main music that plays and during FMVs and battle effects, none of it plays except for the battle theme itself, which again is also missing sort of, I'm not sure what exactly it is. I'm not a sound technician either, but there's it's like, there's a, a bass channel or something missing that is present on the PSP version. Cause I, I, I play it mainly on my actual PSP. But um, whenever I've tried to emulate it, it just sounds worse. Yeah, and um, like even I tried it out and stuff, and I was having really weird issues with the walking speed fluctuating. And even then, I booted up Persona 1 and stuff too, which I'm assuming uses at least a similar engine to do that it's stuff. similar, but it's, it's not even really the same because they rebuilt Persona 1 from the ground up, as I understand it. And even oh. if they had... That was originally a PlayStation 1 game, whereas Devil Summoner 1 was originally a Sega Saturn game. Okay, because I was going to say, yeah, Persona 1 I had no issue with, but Devil Summoner 1, well, there'd be times where I was rocketing down hallways or I was walking at a turtle's pace, and um, I, I kind of took that to say, oh shit, maybe the port is as bad as everyone says, but no, I guess that's just an emulation issue. The speed is pretty fast, because, I mean, as most people know, in, in Soul Hackers and Persona 1, at least in the remakes, you can go really fast. Yeah. Like if you hold down, I think it's either R or B or circle or something. You can just sprint down on a hallway rather than just walk. <laughs> just go Sanic fast. <laughs> oh man. So, I, I guess if you want to give us just a uh, a brief little thing on where you are with the project right now, because what you've said, ninety percent of the game is translated at this point, but you uh, mm -hmm. you're trying to get in contact with a programmer or someone to uh, just help out and make an actual rom hack right right that blew up sort of mildly because i went to gba temp and rom hacking.net and made some threads about it and didn't really get anything from gba temp but on rom hacking um uh, of course the guy everyone knows gideon z i don't know how you pronounce his last name it could be z it could be z i'm not one we always say sure. z so let's go with that okay um so he posted in the thread saying that he was interested in it now um of course he has a long history of having uh done shimmy tensei projects and i think even if people don't like his attitude, most people today would be hard pressed to think of being able to play Shin Megami Tensei One and Two if it weren't for his project. And maybe someone else would have made it. I don't know. But if nothing else, he's to credit for that. So um, yeah, he, he he expressed his interest, and almost immediately afterwards, um, some people who are not fans of his. Now I don't know the history between him and Gemini, but as I'm told, apparently they had some kind of spat at some point. Um, but, uh, someone from, I, I'm going to guess he was from 4chan. I'm not 100% sure, but they posted in the thread and they were, they, you know, they, they were, they were trying to criticize him in a way that I think they were trying to justify, but it was pretty harsh and everyone else in the thread kind of re reacted to it. And eventually the thread ended up getting locked and then the post removed and it was unlocked. I think it was today. I'm not 100% sure, but it was, it's, it's unlocked now. Um, and basically you know, I, I, I talked with uh, Gideon after that, and um, you know, he, I, I think even he knows, um, on, um, or at least acknowledges rather, that you know he, he, he has had a lot of ambition and a lot of problems too. So he has a, he has a lot of projects, sure, but um, you know, if he's uh, gonna try something, he's gonna at least try it, and if he can't, he'll tell me that. And of course, my condition in all this is, is basically that. Um, as long as they talk to me, I don't really care what their attitude is. I just want to know what's going on. I want to know how it's going on, and I want to know if there's some kind of big problem going on. Because if so, you know, figure so it out. So are you guys are you guys trying to get like the PSP ports to work on emulator or? No, no, no. It's it's just it's just about getting the um, text in the ISO to be in English rather than because oh, okay. I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure even what the problem with emulation is. That's probably a thing for the, the emulators themselves, PPSSP P devs to solve or something. Yeah, and actually, so, I want to, I want to stop in real quick there and say a lot of people might be listening to this and going, oh no, that means that unless I own a PSP, I'll never be able to play Devil Summoner. Uh, I, I want to step in and say Persona 1 and 2 were like had terrible, terrible issues for the longest time. But PPSSPP, they, that dev team is fucking fantastic. They, uh, they really improved the emulation a lot with every update. And P Persona yeah. 1 and 2 work almost flawlessly you now. Hell, even, even just Persona recently, 3. yeah. Pers Pers uh, Persona 2 for the longest time had these really bad sound issues. And just recently, actually, those were fixed. So... 
yeah great emulator that, that those guys have there um so yeah if if people are freaking out about that don't worry because you raise a big if, yeah um, if you raise a big enough stink about it i'm pretty sure they will work on <laughs> fixing devil's uh devil summoner for the emulator well, well it I hasn't think, been in english yet so they don't have the demand for it yet obviously yeah that too because um i i think even with um yeah persona 1 and 2 and other sprite based games like that there's like a problem with layering and stuff and just right. enough games were affected by it that the dev team went in and said okay we're gonna try fixing this and sure enough they're fine now um now i guess with devil summoner uh how how large would you say the game is because soul hackers is a pretty short rpg or oh, least, you mean how long is it yeah like how long would you say uh devil well summoner i mean is? it's it's hard it's hard to say because you know even when i've been playing it even though you know i've studied japanese for a long time but i still take longer on a japanese dialogue box than an english one so nat- naturally just going through the dialogue is going to take more time than it would otherwise but if i had to guess i would say probably about as long as persona one if i had to wager just okay. um I, I mean I don't, I don't even know how long that is but you know it's it's it's, it's long enough to be a pretty good mega 10 rpg i think all right Sounds good, cause uh, yeah, I know a lot of people were surprised when Soul Hackers 3DS came over how short it was, but I think to some extent too, people are just spoiled on stuff like Nocturne and SMT4, which can take upwards of 70 plus hours and stuff. So yeah, I spent a long time on four, especially because I yeah. tried to do every ending and that ended up taking a long time. Man, I have a s- neutral save on SMT4. Yeah, where I, did I did every ending. Oh, I I have not done every ending for four yet, but I did. I just did neutral and like all of the side stuff, and it's like 120 hours. I'm like. Yeah, I think I put enough time into SMT4 for a while. But there's exclusive demons if you do the other ones. I know, and I want to fight Demiurge, but I can't. Um, yeah. Yes. Uh, speaking of Demiurge, he first showed up in Devil Summoner 1. Fun fact. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's true, actually. A, lo- a lot of uh, demon designs by uh, Kazuma Kaneko showed up for the first time in uh, Devil Summoner 1. And ironically, a lot of them didn't show up outside of Devil Summoner 1 either. <laughs> um, which I, I think is kind of strange, but yeah, I think it would probably be hard for the dev teams to make them unique enough to be worth it because like there's a lot of like pulp pop culture demons in devil summoner one that just don't show up in other games like um i i I can't speak to all of them but i know for example there's a demon based on uh japanese war veterans from well i mean i don't know war veterans but japanese imperial soldiers from world war ii that you have to fight in a apartment um there's one that's like based on a aspiring photographer ghost that's like trying to take great pictures like there's just a whole bunch of different kinds of demons that just don't show up in other well, games I can see just one of them i can see why some of them wouldn't show up especially after you know the advent of atlas usa well it's, it's, it's not just atlas usa obviously because they don't show up in the japanese smt games either um yeah. even 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 in the very next sequel soul hackers they don't they don't all make an appearance so oh, wow. um yeah, mm-hmm. so, you know, the team at Atlas back during that sort of era of Persona 1, Persona 2, Devil Summoner 1, Devil Summoner 2 is, is I think, pretty uniquely different from the one that has done the more recent Mega Nami Tensei games. I mean, they're sort of turning a new corner with 4 because um, Doi and, uh, what is his name, Yamai, who did this scenario for that, uh, have sort of a very different idea from, say, what they did for Nocturne or Digital Devil Saga. Um, Didn't, um, I know Doi. He does the character design for the Trauma Team games. That Atlas right, does. he 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 did yeah. the character designs for for Trauma Center and for the PSP port of Eternal Punishment. And uh, I want to say one other one, but I can't remember it right now. But anyway, he was yeah, he's, in Mega Ten yeah. stuff before I think before four. Yeah. Four was his first big thing. Like in what? again, this is just the Persona Two credits. But in the Persona Two credits, they note that both. Um, Soejima and uh, Doi did um, aspects of the character graphics in the game itself. So, like, Soejima would do the um, portrait, and then Doi would do the coloring and shading. Oh. So they were yeah, doing that even back in the uh, PlayStation 1 games. Oh, okay. Interesting. So what exactly was, like, what what is Yamai's history with, Me- with uh, Atlas and Mega Ten games? I don't know. Um... I sort of only heard of him um, during 4's development because Same he here. made that famous comment about how you're going to experience psychological trauma. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, well, but other than that, I really don't know. 
Um, I'm sure he's done other stuff with Atlas, uh, maybe even in the Mega Ten series, but I, I just don't know his detailed history. Yeah. Um, I just came out of nowhere. Kind of. Um, so <laughs> I, I guess we kind of ask this with everyone who is involved with translation work. Uh, do you have any advice to give to someone that's uh, trying to learn Japanese or just another language in general even? What's your advice? Well, uh, before I started Japanese, I, I did um, Chinese to a certain extent. Like when I, when I was a little kid, I was in a ch- Chinese-speaking daycare. And then after that, in elementary school, I was at a Chinese after-school program. And, it, and, of course, everybody else in those things is usually Chinese. So for me, just sometimes that helps you and sometimes it doesn't help you because teachers often don't know how to teach to English speakers because most kids who are, who are Chinese or Japanese already know some of the language themselves from being at home. But um, if you're trying to learn a language, and of course, Chinese and Japanese are some of the hardest in the world, but um, I would say just be persistent about it and figure out figure out ways you can work into your ordinary life that help you stay in practice. Because obviously, if you live in, a, you know, even if it's not an English-speaking country, if you live in Spain or Russia or, you know, anywhere in the world that doesn't speak the language you're trying to learn, you're not going to have um, all the opportunities you want to be able to hear it and um, sort of get a more inclusive feel for it than you would if you say, I don't know, listen to the radio or um, you know, play play games in that language and sort of write down all the words you don't know, or you know, any sort of number of techniques you can go for that'll that'll help you get more accustomed to it. And I would say just just stay just stay optimistic and stay determined about it. All right. Yeah. So um, uh, shoot. I guess where do we go from there, Katsu? You got any questions to fill in while I think of more? <laughs> think of more questions hmm. just in terms of translation or game stuff or even hell let's let's talk about devil summoner one for a bit uh i have some other stuff to say about it if you guys don't have anything else to ask oh um yeah go for it then just whatever you want to throw out there um okay so for a long time um people were well you know in a long time but some people on um some message boards made timelines you were talking about timelines before some people made timelines uh sort of according to what they thought it was and you know, we were, we were talking earlier about how two games take place in the same year, and so you have to kind of figure out what, what part of the year it takes place in if you want to connect them and stuff like that. But I, I think people should probably keep in mind when they're trying to map that stuff out that sometimes even the directors don't necessarily plan them as neatly as you might want them to be. Yeah. So say so even if, say, the Devil Summon art book says that that game takes place in 1996 and then Persona 1 takes place in 1996 and so on and so forth, they may not necessarily fit together in a way that makes logical sense, even if this, even if from a story perspective they're supposed to be in the same universe. Now, mm-hmm. I don't I don't subscribe to every single theory like that because there's like one theory that says uh, Demi Fiend shows up in Digital Devil Saga 1, therefore Digital Devil Saga 1 follows from the neutral ending or the reset ending rather of Shimano Tensei 3 which I mean you know it's possible in a kind of vague sense but there's not much evidence for it other than there's the fact that especially since game. Demi especially since Demi Fink can move about the Amala network right so I mean there's there's that aspect of it too and then there's another one that says um, Shin Megami Tensei Strange Journey's neutral ending leads into Shin Megami Tensei 4 because they have demonicas in that game and that's possible but it's kind of unlikely because that's the only piece of evidence you have to suggest that I think that one's really weird, too, because I think it that I, I, I don't know, but I just have the assumption that after the strange journey neutral ending, like, I think humanity is pretty fucking good on dealing with demons at that point. Yeah, like, I oh, mean, it's kind of done with demons. The moral of every neutral ending is kind of always the same thing of, you know, even though you've made, a, you know, sort of balanced decision now. You're, there's going to need to be other people in the future who will continue the work that you've done here in order for it to stay the same. Yeah, yeah. Now, that, that, even that doesn't always work, but that's sort of the general idea that you need to have balance, but you have to be assured that even though law and chaos promise sort of absolute solutions, neutral is always kind of a temporary thing. That's the thing with the neutral endings, right? Because they're never set in stone, done. Yeah. Whereas law and chaos, the world's kind of stuck that way for quite quite some time. Like even um, uh, one thing that always stuck out to me is that Suro's route, which I guess you could kind of view as a fucked up version of neutral um, in Devil Survivor 1. Uh, there's a little quip that Naoya gives him. They're like, hey, I'll try again in like 1,500 years or some shit. And it's like, uh, is it really worth it then? If this is just going to happen a couple thousand years later, you know what I mean? So. Well, you got to remember that neutral doesn't mean good ending. It, it just means that it's for the sake of 
more or less maintaining what you already have and making sure that humans still have a role to play. Yeah. So, so for example, e- 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 even though Atsuro is saying like, oh, you know, let's let's use the demons for our benefit. Like it's maybe it's not a good ending, but it's mm-hmm. it's in it's in the interest of what the humans want if they want to survive. Kind of reminds me of the anguish one. Well, sort of reminds me of the anguish one route in uh, Double Survivor Two, where. I feel like that route is more chaotic than it is neutral and it's not one it's not like the chaotic ending where like demons take over and everything just goes to shit. It kind of it even it embodies the philosophy of chaos like shape the world to your own benefits, but it was a lot more peaceful about it, I guess. More about liberation kind of. Yeah, more way. about liberation. Well, there yeah, are as many man. interpretations of what those three things mean than as as there are authors of the series in the yeah. world. So, I mean, you 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 could argue any number of the endings are in some sense a good ending for at least some group. So, you know, that's that's sort of the whole point. Speaking of alignment actually. So, Soul Hackers had a thing where even though there wasn't alignment based endings, all the demons still had alignments oh, yeah. to them and that's kind of how they restricted what demons you could summon i'm assuming devil summoner one does the same like all the other old well, smt yeah stuff. okay so there are alignments for the demons like light neutral dark chaos whatever it happens to be i in, in my time playing it i haven't actually ever had a thing where it said you can't have these demons in your party because it's restricted now i know in the 3ds version of soul hackers they they had had a um hack that you could use that basically just made that whole thing meaningless yeah, but um, I haven't actually had it happen once in the first game where they restricted you from using demons. That's but, uh, no, it, it, I mean, it might happen. I haven't really gone out of my way to see if dark chaos mingles with light law or whatever <laughs> two would be most diametrically opposed. But um, I assume at some point, either you know, maybe if you're, I mean, because you don't become chaos chaos align, your party moves towards chaos or law depending on who's in it, and I think. Mm-hmm. Um, you and uh, Ray are both neutral, neutral. So, yeah, I don't know how that would go. I have, I, again, I haven't tried, but it might be interesting to look at it. Yeah, and um, I know even that I, I kind of liked that in um, Soul Hackers because it gave like a weird artificial sense of replayability because you could go through the entire game with just a law dependent party and you just couldn't really use Chaos Demons that much because of that. Or then later on, on your second playthrough, you could go all chaos and stuff like that and see the minor gameplay differences. Could be fun. I don't know. For, for me, if a game gives me an option to not have to have a restriction, I'm, I'm kind of bad at following it. So, like, <laughs> if, if, if Solaker says, hey, you know what? You don't have to explore all 50 teleporter entrances <laughs> to know where how to get to the ending. Are you sure you want to do that? I'd probably say, well... I mean, I'll try it a few times, and then after, like, five times, I just give up. I'm, I'm kind of casual that way. It's all good. <laughs> oh, man. But I like a better challenge if it's not even available, because then I don't have any choice. All right, and uh, I guess this is kind of late, but I just thought of it now. How would you, um, if you had to give, like, a quick little pitch to someone that had no clue, maybe if they're a Mega 10 fan, but they just, they're not familiar with Devil Summoner 1 exactly... Uh, how would you how would you describe Devil Summoner One just in terms of I would plot? say I would say it's a I would say it's a well written hard boiled story about a detective and um, how he lost his life. <laughs> oh man, that's pretty good. Um, and of course, we have everyone's favorite antagonist, at least my favorite antagonist design, Sid Davis. Oh, yeah? Uh, yeah, well, he's, you know, I, I've always said this about the Devil Summoner series. It seems strange to me that every sort of enemy organization is either staffed or run by people who seem to be, like, foreigners. Because, like, Sid Davis is uh, black. I don't know if he's American necessarily, but he's certainly black in the uh, among every other person in the game who is decidedly not black, obviously. Um, and in Soul Hackers, you had... Um, uh naomi who was a um i don't don't quite remember what her whole story is but uh, apparently she was like an orphan in hong kong or something and then there was the and then there was the uh, indian guy with the sax comp and then in rido games there was uh rasputin as well so it's sort of a trend of that goddamn foreigners trying to come in here and take over my clean japan I mean, that was a big theme in, in Raido, because even in the era in Japan that that takes place, and that was a, a big fear at the time. Yeah. yeah. And, I mean, we've even talked about that, too, how in SM, well, I guess on the podcast, um, with SMT1, 
there's a kind of a major theme there with the uh, religious missionaries and stuff with the messiahs and them kind of right. coming in and forcing people to convert and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, forcing their ideals on people. Yeah. Well, it's not coincidence that most of the American army They're in that game is Tumblr. on the law side. Yeah. They're literally um, Tumblr trying to for, force ideals onto people who don't really care. Oh, man. Well, I mean, it's a bit more complicated than that, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so, I'm kind of out of stuff to ask. Katsu, if you have anything else. Um, when when When's the game coming out? Oh, well, uh, they get a programmer. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, the translation, every single thing that we've done up until now is up whenever anyone wants to look at it in the ROM hacking thread, which I mean, you can post it in this uh, description if you want, or you can just put it up somewhere. Um, but yeah, all of the uh, pretty much all of the script is there except for the last part, and the weapons and armor names are up there, and as well as the um, TV news pieces that talk about the events relating to SMT1. Um, so you can pretty much find out what the whole story is about right now if you want. But uh, I, I know at least some people are waiting until it actually is in a game format to play it, which I completely understand. But um, that may be longer because I don't have any control over that, obviously. Yeah. So it's just dependent on if 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 it's not too hard for Gideon to do it, then he'll probably do it. And you know I'll talk with him about how that's going to work out. But um, if we have to end up finding someone else, then that could take as long as that takes. Now, do you want me to put your email in the description? And then if anyone here is a COS listener and thinks they're a good enough programmer to work here with frequency and maybe get something going, if uh, the thing with Gideon doesn't work out or just uh, maybe it works out better like like that, um, do you want me to just put your email down below and people can shoot you a message? Um... Yeah, sure. You know, my only requirement or even just request in all this is that you maybe hope to get it done in less than three years. That is probably <laughs> my that is, that is my time frame. Um, so, uh, and, you know, if, if you happen to live in Pacific Standard Time, that's a benefit. Um, but other than that, I don't really have any any requirements other than having to hack a PSP game. Hey, uh-oh, did we lose someone? I think, huh? I think Katsu dropped. Oh, well. Oh. Um he'll come back um, okay so and then i guess you said too, just keep in contact with you two and give you right. updates with how it's going because so, right because i mean there's there's definitely going to be some issues where maybe say the text box isn't, isn't able to accommodate a certain sentence or something that we ended up doing so we might have to reword it or something like that so that's that's going to be part of that as well okay um and then i guess just with that if uh <laughs> well first of all i guess if if you know you're not equipped to handle the job or you don't or you're just not going to email him anything helpful, please do not spam him because that's just not great and that'll do nothing but hinder the project. I mean, everyone's excited to possibly get a taste of Devil Summoner 1, so please be respectful, guys. I'm sure our listeners are oh. smart people. <laughs> Hang on, I, I, just, I just remembered something and I was very stupid for only remembering it now. Um, uh, I should have mentioned this at the, at the very beginning, but half of the script is um, done by the other translator. I don't have a username for him or anything because he just only went by number two when we were doing it in the uh, message board. But parts four, five, and six are all done by him. So give him a give him a just just as much thanks as you, as you give me, if anything. If you if if you're gonna write it down somewhere, write that he's credited for half of it. And if he <laughs> wants to come on this show, call him and. Uh, send him a gift basket and then have him come on this show oh yeah totally Cause... man uh number two as he goes by if you're if you're out there and you want to be on cos as well we'll totally have you on it'll be fun um right. and everyone give him thanks for also helping out and doing pretty much as uh as much work as you have right pretty much because said, he's because so. he's done the script and i've i've sort of done a, a couple additional things like the weapon and armor and tv news stuff but he's he's also translated some of the like fan comics and um some some other stuff like that which which is, is kind of uh, above and beyond what we really need to be doing for the game which is you know a testament to both his ability as a translator and his uh helpfulness to the fan community i think so um yeah that's that's that's, that's why i would say he he's he's arguably done more than i have <laughs> Okay, uh, I'm alive again. Okay, there we go. We're we're back in business with everyone. Okay, so I guess going from there, I, I think actually you just told this to me in private. You're as excited as everyone else to 
if not oh, more, sure. to play this in English too, right? Because I because I haven't actually finished it entirely in Japanese either. I so because I only translated the first three parts of the script, and well, I mean, and the last part too. But I haven't beaten the game in Japanese yet, so I would be I'd be just just as excited to to beat it in English as I would anybody <laughs> else. Oh man, and I I've said this before. Devil Summoner One is probably one of the two big Mega Ten right. games that people really want to play in English. The other being yeah, SMTF. Yeah. Right. Will we ever get an SMTF translation? I would say probably. I, I, yeah. I'd say probably. I mean, I'm sure yeah. at some point we're going to get to a point where Mega Ten is just big enough and there's enough people interested in the games and whatnot that uh, more more and more groups and stuff like that, maybe not even uh, get English versions of the games, but just have translations up and whatnot for, like, I guess how I'll look at Danganronpa 1 where they had the uh, right. something awful Let's Play thing that kind of acted as a translation there. I, I yeah. wouldn't be surprised if more and more of those popped up for stuff like Last Bible 3 and stuff like well, that. I don't know how many fans of Last Bible 3 are in this podcast. but <laughs> Hey, there's some um, kid there's some kid that played Dev- uh, Revelations of the Demon Slayer and is like, fuck, I really want to play that third game. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure. Um, but, uh, you know, I think after that uh, SMT uh, cross Fire Emblem game comes out, I think that'll definitely spark some interest in what the other games are about. And I mean, they've already released SMT1 on iOS, which, I mean, admittedly is not a fantastic translation of the game. But uh, just the fact that they release it on their shows, they still give some amount of shit about it. Yeah, that's so, a miracle um, in and of itself yeah. that it even came out, honestly. <laughs> I mean, I haven't played it. I don't own any iOS devices. I don't know anyone else who is going to play it who owns an iOS device. But the fact that they released it at all is uh, amounts to something. It's actually so, a really, really, really great um, version of it. I was, I was really impressed by the amount of effort they put in. Well, it's, it's again. I, I would, I would argue it's probably worse than the Aeon Genesis translation, but it's, it's, it's something in there which I think is says, has more about that. And maybe, maybe. On the uh, PSN at some point, they'll have like a classics release where they have the PlayStation 1 versions of SMT1, SMT2, and If, which would be, I think, a, a boon to anyone who wants to play this series. Yeah, actually, um, I think um, John Harden, on, someone actually asked that on the um, Mega 10 subreddit thing, and John Harden lurks there. And he, it was one of the funniest things I've seen on there where he, he posted something like, oh, I'll ask around the office, and like 30 minutes later came back, it's like, yeah, I don't think that's going to happen, so... I mean that's that's not great, but uh, I, you know I I wonder how much work that would actually be for them to do because I mean even like even if at a bare minimum they sort of you know went hat in hands to even Aeon Genesis and said hey look uh, you guys already finished two can we just use what you already did and just make it into a game for the PlayStation One <laughs> like I mean that would be I think that they wouldn't do just based on you know corporate practice or any number of other reasons but I'm just saying in a sort of ideal world, they could do that in probably not that much time. I mean, for all I know, even Atlas Japan doesn't have the original copy of SMT1 <laughs> on the P- P- PSX anymore. But yeah. I, I don't know. You know, it's 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 kind of a, a ideal dream for anyone who wants to play that game. I um I, I've heard too that just Sony and Nintendo in general aren't too keen unless you're a company that they're really buddy buddy with with um yeah. releasing translated versions of like the uh like the classics and stuff like that on Virtual Console or PSN, which is unfortunate because there's a lot of older games that it'd be really nice to just get a translation and put it up on PS1 Classic or something. Because right, it's new to them if you haven't played it yet. So. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. So, like, oh, man, I really wish Sony and Nintendo would lighten up on stuff like that, but I guess that's their that's kind of their stance they take on it, sadly. Like, um, I know with Nintendo they're a little bit lighter on it, but they very rarely allow it. Like, I think the only few games that have been translated are uh, first-party Nintendo games or just games that Nintendo themselves have had a little bit of history with. So that's kind of a shame. But, uh, Usually the less work it is, the more likelihood that they'll <laughs> be able to put it out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, man. Uh, so uh, I guess Frequency, if you have anything else to say, we can transition into emails. Um, um, how about... Uh, uh, oh, uh, I've. Uh, if anyone from SMTG is listening, I'm often in the uh, VG board. So if you have any other questions about it that for some reason I didn't answer here, you can ask me there, or go on the ROM hacking site and PM me there, or email me as these two fellows will post on the <laughs> on the video of this. Um, and also, um, after. Um, the uh, Devil Summoner 1 project is uh, done, at least on the translation side, and until there's some other major catastrophe that arises. Um, I would like to see about 
uh, maybe uh, working on the PSP version of Persona 2. Um, I mean the it, the uh, the unlocalized one anyway, um, because they have the additional scenario in it, it, Eternal Punishment Portable, which it, it currently has a has an English summary up on the paste bin in SMTG. But um, I would like to be able to translate that because it somehow links Persona 2 to Persona 3 even more than it already has, which I think is oh, sort wow. of invaluable in the, in the same way. That. I, I mean, it's I mean, it's, it's it's not quite what you're thinking of, I suspect, but basically, it explains why uh, you no longer fight demons in Persona Three and instead fight oh, shadows. Oh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's actually a big question that the fan base has kind of pondered over. So that's pretty cool. Um, right, and of course, everyone is kind of uh, curious about uh, Ultimax's story because of the implications of the shadow stuff in that. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, I, I think that would be a worthwhile use of my time. I mean, if if the translation of if is as done as Aeon Genesis says it is, um, then I then I think that's a, probably a more practical use of uh, translation work than trying to totally redo if again. Yeah, yeah. Oh man. So um. Well, yeah. What's your what's your thoughts on like the Ultimax shadows and the Persona Two shadows? Well, I see. I, I my my main issue with that is the. I mean, this is kind of a trivial thing, I actually. But um, the fact that uh, the director of Persona Four Ultimax, or I mean, uh, from every game from Persona Three to now even, um, Katsuda Hoshino, uh, Hashino, because H A S, yeah, he has said that he doesn't want to bring in older characters um, because. I mean, I can't remember what his reason was. He said like he he didn't want to interfere interfere it with other his directors' work. work. Yeah. yeah, But my main issue with that is that story wise, like some people say that the Persona users from that time have moved on, which I think makes sense for most of them. <laughs> but um, like like Baofu is definitely too old. Uh, you all is probably <laughs> not gonna care about it because she works with him now. And you know, most of the other characters probably don't have anything to do with it. But at least like uh not nanjo is one example that people often bring up because he is the head of a huge company that was once um in, in part the of the Kare- as Kare- yeah. right yeah and they even get mentioned in persona 3 so to say that oh yeah he t- totally moved on from that like it, it seems kind of uh, disingenuous. Yeah. it seems yeah. like it didn't involve him in some way especially with all the crazy stuff that carijo has been doing like he's because... constantly talking about in persona 2 about how he has to atone for all this and he's going to make amends he's going to do all these different like, things and the whole like, the uh, whole mess with the two show minizukis that that has direct con- control over what like the carijo has been doing right it's so... going to be related to them in some way and you know they, they say in in persona 4 uh, persona 4 arena rather that the shadow operatives are a secret sort of wing of the police, and the only police character who's ever been in a Persona game is Katsuya, and he is. You telling me that that the the only Persona user in the entire police force is not involved in the Persona <laughs> unit of the police force? Yeah. I mean that. that well, you there's know, a dot. Why he was in jail? Okay. <laughs> yeah, he's in jail. He's he's not really. Jail. <laughs> but you know, they they and, they and, tease uh, it in in uh, Ultimax because with the character palettes, I know, with because they they have um they they gave Adachi the Kyoji palette. Yeah, that was cool. The Theodore palette and the Katsuya palette, which is just is it kind of a spit in the face of everybody because they did that silhouette thing back in Persona 4 Arena, which I think drove everybody who was even remotely interested in those characters crazy because yeah. it's like saying things without saying them. And some people have even said the same thing about Neil Arthotep and Philemon that um, the reason they, they don't ever name drop them actually is because if they did that, then they would have to try and dredge up old stuff and explain it to anyone who's new to the series. But they do it in such a way that anyone who knows who they are will know who it is. But I, you know, I think that's kind of a cop out answer because if you don't mention it, there's always an excuse for someone to go, "Oh no, that's not really them. It's a new thing." Even if it's the exact same like motivation, mm-hmm. um, goals, what what it is they do, they're gonna and uh, you know, there's there's enough in- inconsistencies as it is. All right, I think we have gone enough on about that. So uh, it's time for everyone's favorite time of the day, and that is emails. So let me pull up the emails, actually. The first question we have comes from a new emailer called Jomamatron, and uh, he or she says, SMT4 is my personal favorite Shin Megami Tensei game, and I feel that it towers above the rest in the series in terms of quality. Yet other people don't seem to think uh, to talk about this game like this. Is it a bad game? What are you guys' personal opinions on it? Uh, where would you place it in comparison to the rest of the series? Now, I thought this was an interesting question because um, I've really seemed to 
seen the past couple of months just a lot of people saying oh smt4 is a bad game a lot of people have shat on it and uh-huh. i mean i've even seen a few people that listen to this podcast say oh well rosin and katsu don't like it they said this this and this about it before yeah. and i think a lot of people have kind of misinterpreted what people say about smt4 as saying i don't like it because of this where i think most people are saying this is a fantastic game but this this and this are wrong wrong with it right um because i will say smt4 was easily one of the it, it was the best RPG, hands down, for me in 2013. I and think maybe that's a bit game. much. I don't know. I, it was, it I was like Fire Emblem better. Well, oh. Fire Emblem's a strategy RPG. I mean, of better. that year's releases, maybe, because I haven't really played that many RPGs in the past year other than Soul Hackers and SMT4, but, um, I mean, maybe in that context, but yeah, as, an, as an RPG itself, it has a lot of issues, I think. Yeah, Um. so I, I, think, I think that's actually a big thing, is that... Uh, Basically, just a lot of people seem to think that, oh, a lot of people don't like it because of these issues. I think most people actually really liked it, or maybe if not thought it was the best thing ever, but they at least thought it was a good game, just there is a few flaws that uh, were apparent with stuff like the difficulty balancing, I know was a big one for people, Uh, a lot of people... Yeah, why was Nar- why was Nar- yeah, like why was Nariku so hard but the rest of the game so easy? <laughs> well, that's how almost all SMT games are if you actually think about it. That the, the the beginning of the game is where you get wiped a lot and then after that it kind of becomes easy because you can exploit weaknesses easier and you have more options to go into well, battle. Yeah, right. Yeah. I, think... I, was, I was about to, I was about to argue Digital Devils Saga but I kind of play that game too much. <laughs> um I think Digital Devil Saga actually gets a lot easier towards the end just cuz you have so many yeah. mantras at your disposal. Um no, but, yeah, I think a big part of that, too, was just the challenge quest system in that game. Uh, I think yeah. I think part of it was, I don't think the developers really realized how completionist a lot of Mega Ten fans are, because yeah. I have a feeling if you don't, if you play that game and you don't do a lot of challenge quests, it's probably a lot harder, and th- maybe that's what they were gunning for, like, maybe they assumed people would only do one or two challenge quests be- between each uh, story thing or whatever, but... Me and I think a lot of other people, uh, as soon as this new side quest opened up, we did it. And yeah. when all of the side quests were done, we went on to the. Uh, the right, next that's story a common part. sort of trope. But I mean, the issue is even on the neutral ending, you end up having to do quite a few side quests, which oh, are, yeah. I guess, no longer side quests, but they're main quests. But <laughs> um, I don't know. My main issue with SMT4 is not necessarily the difficulty, because I mean, you can set it to whatever you want, you can make it even harder, which I don't know if that actually benefits you or not. But. Um, for, for example, like a lot of the concept art displayed a lot of really cool sort of thinking about the art direction, and even in the game, you can still see it, but like all of the underground districts that were, you know, even though they were certainly secluded and like driven down from the surface had like nobody in it. Like I get that it's the 3DS and you can't necessarily have like a huge bustling area of people, but like there was three people. And even, even once you come back from the blasted Tokyo, um, infernal Tokyo areas, everybody is gone. (laughs) <laughs> even even after you do the thing where you give them their the confidence back and they'll come out and say oh yeah you're great you're the champion they're still gone from all of the underground <laughs> districts yeah. and even even in ikebukuro where they come out and say oh we don't have anything to fear anymore there's still demons walking around <laughs> <laughs> like it, it just just feels incomplete yeah. does it feel like a sense of time is, has passed and... no yeah <laughs> Oh, man. It's like you went in, the the demons were there, they said hoorah, thank you for all your help, and then went back in the little cardboard box. <laughs> oh man. Okay, so um I think I, I think um I guess I'll just call you Tron because calling you Joe Mama would be weird. I think that that's just a, a big thing where um I, th- I think the the common saying is I uh, I can I can talk bad about this thing because I love it so much and I want it to be better. And I think that's why I guess with just a lot of games criticism in general, people focus on the negative because what's good about a game you want to stay and you don't need to talk about. What's what was bad about a game is what you want to be talking about. So yeah, that, I just want to talk about it so that the next game might be better. Yeah, so the improvements right. can be made and all that stuff. So I think just I'm sometimes really, we lose sight of that. Yeah, that's part of the reason why I'm looking forward to Shin Megami Tensei Cross Fire Emblem. And also due to the fact that we don't even know who's writing this game. <laughs> oh, man. oh my god, that's the scary part. Who's writing it? <laughs> who's writing what? <laughs> who's writing it? Who's writing it? Oh yeah. It? I don't know. <laughs> who's writing this game? Hopefully it's someone good. Um, I guess it's Dingo. <laughs> yes. Oh man, we are Stephen King. The his first foray into video game writing. Yeah. Um, I'd be so down with that. 
Actually, I don't know how well he'd do with video game stuff. Um, yeah. Anyways, um, I guess um, moving on to our second email. This is from Amanda, and she says, Hi, Rosin and Katsu. First off, I want to say that I love your podcast. I stumbled across it a few months ago, and have been trying to keep current with it. I haven't listened to most of the early podcasts yet, so if my question has been asked already, I apologize. It's taken me this long to think of a good question to send in, uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's a repeat. Uh, uh, I chose this, so I'm assuming it's not a repeat. Um, Anyways... She says, my friends and I have been speculating about Persona 5 like everybody else on the planet and got to discussing the SMT demon slash Persona roster in general. We notice how over the years Atlas has decided to add more and more demons that aren't technically mythological. Demons like Joan Arc, who was a real person, and Chemtrail, which is more of an urban legend. It also seems like Atlas has started to branch out just a little bit more and added more Western-influenced demons. What future demons or personas do you think Atlas might add in the future? Do you think that they'll maybe expand to other urban le- legends, literature, folktales, or more underrepresented um, world mythologies like Africa, Oceania, etc.? I, pers- I personally think seeing more fairy tales like Little Red, Hi- uh, Little Red Riding Hood, etc. would be interesting, but I don't know how well that would work out. Are there any mythological figures or historical people you'd like to see added to future games? Finally, I... Are- Add Martin Luther King as a as a persona. <laughs> My God. Finally, are there any demons from the older SMT games that you'd like to see brought back and used in future games? I we awesome. were actually just talking about this. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I didn't even think about that. Um, because like, if you look at the the story of Soul Hackers, uh, Kenap, Manitou, and a number of the other demons in that are North American demons. Yeah. And um, in as, as I, was, I was talking about earlier in Devil Summoner 1, there were a lot of pop, pop culture demons that just didn't show up again. Um, like, I think even in SMT4, there were a few that sort of came back, like uh, Patriot or, um, uh, who was it, uh, Tattoo Man, who was like, who was like <laughs> a sort of a Yakuza-looking guy with a tattoo on his back with a Jack Frost that said, go to Frozen instead of go to hell. <laughs> Which was, I mean, I, you know, um, I'm not sure how pop culture that is necessarily, because maybe it's like supposed to be more of a zombie or some other thing like that, but... You know, there are definitely pop culture demons in SMT, but I think if I had to, you know, focus on more of them, I would say, you know, think of, um, like, Jack the Ripper hasn't been in that many SMT games, because um, he's, he's part of the Jack Brothers thing, but he just doesn't show up yeah. that often. Yeah. Uh, maybe uh, Jason or Freddy for, or um, <laughs> uh, Michael Myers. I don't know. Or at some, least a ripoff, something like, like that. that. Sure. Um, cause I don't know if they could totally do it with the rights and whatnot, but, um, that would right. be, they could do it in Japan because copyright is pretty lax there. I don't think they can pull that off in America. They probably have to change the persona names. What are you talking about? Descriptions. I mean, it's not like Jojo steal stuff all the time. Um, no, <laughs> like but, you could uh, just call Michael Myers Halloween instead of actually Michael Myers. Yeah, there we go. Like, um, stuff like that. Um, I, I don't know, because I've said this before, I'd love to see Native American stuff, because I think Native American stuff in general is just totally underrepresented, and that's a really interesting mythology, just the various um, legends and myths and stuff that the various tribes in North America set up and stuff. I really think that a lot of media in general just doesn't tap into as much as it should. Sure. Um, as far as historical figures go, I think uh, that'd be interesting, but I, I'm trying, I'm grasping at straws here with... Uh, what exactly, like, who exactly they could use, like, I guess, like, Bloody Mary, I, I, she probably is already in there somewhere. That... She's been in one game. Yeah. Which I think it was nine, even, which is strange. <laughs> nine is a strange nine. game in general. Yeah, um, you know, you gotta remember, uh, Hitler was in Persona 2. Yeah, that so, too. Yes. Um, but, I mean, the, you know, you know they, here's, here's the thing, though. A lot of people, well, not all people, but some people think that that change in um, his appearance was because of, like, censoring or something from the American team. But actually, there was a new Sero uh, regulation, which is, like, the ESRB in Japan, that said that you couldn't use historical figures in fictional works. So oh. they, had to, they had to put sunglasses on him. The one about, <laughs> the one about games like Sengoku Basara and, like... Dynasty uh, I, I think there's like a, a certain kind of restriction or a limit to it like if you oh. if, if it's not explicitly them in the same way like if you say this is a representation of them and not actually supposed to be the real person but the idea of i guess in the persona 2 game was like oh they brought him back from the dead or he survived the whole time or like it was, it was, it was there was some te- te- technicality about it that made it so that they had to do that but i, I mean in, in a way i think it almost made it cooler because obviously it wasn't actually hitler in the first place it was just neil arthur conjuring up 
some mm -hmm. Hitler that came from the rumors that were circling around. Um, so yeah, I mean, that, you, you, you could do stuff like that and it could be interesting, I think. Yeah, like, um, I think also a big part of that, too, is um, with the, you mentioned Sengoku Basara. I'm probably butchering the pronunciation on that. Um, yeah. Like, I think there's a difference between having Hitler, who is, you know, obviously a really touchy subject, especially in, like, Japan and whatnot, too, with their feelings about World War II, versus, like, historical stuff Japanese like that. Japanese figures like Masa yeah. and all that. Yeah, I think they, it might be, and also it's a lot more recent, so I think, you know, that yeah. could play a big part of it, too. Um, but, yeah, just, like, I'm trying to think, like, royalty in general could probably, I mean, even, like, ancient You could Japanese have Marie Antoinette. Stuff. Oh, that'd be yeah. cool. Um, they, yeah, they could. <laughs> I want to see a Napoleon demon. Let's be serious here. Sure. Napoleon. Or an Abraham Lincoln demon. That'd be. Yes. Annie Oakley demon. Uh, you know, fucking, why not have, have Abraham Lincoln, the main character's persona in Persona 5? Yeah. Because everyone wants some anticipation, so. Yeah, it's, yes. It's, yeah. Oh, my <laughs> God. What if the personas are presidents? Oh, God. <gasps> that would be. We discovered pretty something. Dumb. <laughs> that would be terrible. <laughs> Yahweh is just George W. Bush now. Yeah. Um, be making political satire all, all over the place. Oh, man. Um, okay, so I lost track of my next email. Okay, here we go. Um, all right, so here we have our third email here. Thank you, Amanda, for your question. Got a good conversation out of that. So Sirt asks, um, let's see. Since I just finished the uh, Hidoshira fight, it feels appropriate timing to ask what our views are on the optional bosses of SMT. So, do you think every game should have one? Should they be easier or harder? Margaret was a real pushover, in my opinion, and wasn't as luck-based as Elizabeth or Hidoshor uh, Hitoshira. Do you think it should stay that way, and will you... F uh... Oh, he's asking, will I fight him in the SMT1 playthrough, because uh, his name is Sirt. Ha. Ah, got another demon role player, it seems, emailing us. So, um... Uh -huh. I I guess with um, I guess what are your guys' thoughts on bonus bosses and stuff? Personally, I love them. <laughs> yeah, I love them too. I was like like, like our emailer. I was really disappointed with the Margaret fight in Persona Four, but the Persona Three portable fight made up for it a lot. Hmm. Yeah, you know, I th I like the idea of them. I think, but I you know I, I don't really understand his criticism that the other bonus bosses weren't luck based enough because I don't really want bonus <laughs> bosses to be luck based in the first place. But um, like I, I think the gimmick with Elizabeth I don't really remember, but it was like she had a pattern to it, and like if you used yeah. Ar Ar Armageddon or something, she would just kill you in one hit or something. Yeah. Um. So I mean you know that's 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 not a good. I mean that's that's that, rather that's not a bad fail safe method. I don't think. But if you want to do that, I think you need to you know think about what you're going to do to make that kind of the penultimate boss of your game like um soul hackers had uh kyoji and sid davis and raido in it and stuff like that which you know is not is is not bad because they're all sort of tied together and interesting to see what they have to say and stuff like that but like p people said in um shimiro hensei 4 that like they would be interested to see like a strange journey protagonist secret <laughs> boss or um um a uh, surf secret boss or stuff like that which you know i think would be interesting but it just is more about how they fight you yeah, yeah. um i mean even i was talking about this a bit before i'm still fucking stuck uh stuck on satan from <laughs> digital yeah, devil side satan too is, satan is such a bullshit boss fight that that rng just if it's if if the rng doesn't like you for that fight you would i'm sorry but you can't you can't win um and that it gets to a point where with bonus bosses it gets to a point sometimes where it's just a little too frustrating. Like, even Demi Fiend. Uh, Demi Fiend was really, really hard, and also it was a lot of preparation. But once you finally were fully prepared for the Demi Fiend fight, still sometimes it came down to luck a little bit, but you still felt like you had accurately prepared and you you deserved the victory. Well, Satan, I'm starting to feel like I'm not even going to feel that good when I finally beat him, yeah. just because it, you, it is so luck-based. You can prepare all you want for Satan. You can still lose. Yeah, and lose back. Right, I mean, ha having to just roll a dice whenever you fight a boss is not really fun or challenging. Yeah, and it doesn't feel as good because you don't feel like you had that big of a push too. So like, right. I think that's a big part of why SMT is so successful and has such a diehard fan base is because it makes you feel like you outsmarted the game. It makes you feel like you are, you deserved the win and you finally outsmarted the enemy that was giving you so much trouble and all that. And 
if if you if the player can tell that a lot of it comes down to luck, they're just not going to feel as good because they just felt like they got lucky. So, um, I guess there is a place for that too when you get out of sticky situations and whatnot. But with like hard boss fights that you need to spend hours and hours grinding and preparing for, I feel, I pers- it's not that fun yeah. feeling. I personally don't feel like Elizabeth was as luck based as some people say, but then again. It's been a while since I last fought her, so. Yeah, Pers- mm. Persona three and four were big on that, weren't they? That the sort of Velvet Room people that were working with you were really focused on what you could do and what you were doing, and you know why you were so powerful. That it was, it was sort of a big shift from Persona two, where, you know, going to see Igor was just like a, a thing you did when 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 you went to the supermarket. Like it was, it was just a very different kind of tone, and it really shows in that boss battle. I think. Yeah. yeah. Um. Bonus bosses are fun. <laughs> yeah, I think, sure. think I'll uh, leave it at that. Um, so yeah, thank you for the question, sir, and uh, thanks for the uh, email and whatnot. And got a good conversation going off of that one too. So um, I guess this will be our last um, last one. There's multiple questions in this, and it's kind of longer. Um, so this is from Neutral, and uh, he has a little bit of a thing at the start, but um, I- I'm gonna have to skip it for now and just get to the questions because I think we're a little over an hour at this point. So. Uh, Let's uh, let's get to the questions. There's uh, four here, or actually five. Sorry. Um, first one is uh, well, I guess this, he says this isn't so much a question but a theory. Um, he says that it, it's about Steven, and it's not very clear if he is exactly human or not, uh, given that he's all over the place and he has kind of an echoey voice in SMT4 and the shiny anime glasses. <laughs> um, and he says that the fact is that he seems like he's been alive for a very long time, if not forever. Um, and now. Uh, he may have said that he wasn't a demon, but he says he doesn't ever recall him explicitly saying he was human either. Uh, but he doesn't think he's an angel either, so what exactly is he? Is it uh, possible that he's similar to whatever Elizabeth, Theodore, and Margaret are? They're all humanoid, not exactly humans, have gray hair uh, that could be chalked up to old age, but uh, their eyes are all kind of odd. Um, with uh, Elizabeth- <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, and he says Steven's eyes are um, covered, but could they also be gold like them? Now, I don't... Now, uh, and then he just okay. kind of makes it like that. Now, I wouldn't say that Steven is paranormal in nature. I think he just kind of... He's a smart dude, and I think he's just kind of been able to cheat death and the multiverse at large because of yeah. technology and whatnot. Margaret um, and yeah, the rest of the Velvet Room attendants, they don't even know who they are. Like, part of their personal journey with like helping the protagonist is trying to learn about themselves like where do they come from who are they because yeah they don't even know let me just say one thing I, you know I don't, i'm not trying to be rude to neutral here but I, I think he's reading into it too much um like i i get that he's trying to make connections here but steven has gray hair and most of the velvet room attendants have white hair as well but that's i don't think they're trying to relate the two with that yeah, and I the don't thing with the yeah with the yellow eyes is usually a feature of the collective unconscious sort of thing that they were talking about in persona 2 because i mean neil neil nah, neil arthotep had, had yellow eyes and everything that he made had yellow eyes and all of the shadows in persona 4 had yellow eyes you know that's that's kind of a thing that they do whenever to they want to they want to indicate some other kind of influence or creation source or that sort of thing but steven and the smt series mainline in general is not really part of that um you know what whether steven's eyes are yellow or not is kind of irrelevant i think but as as for what he's saying like whether he's human or not whether he's been alive for a long time Steven, at least, uh, according to SMT1, was uh, one of the people working on the terminal system, and mm-hmm. he created the demon summoning program, of course. Yep. Now, I mean, the, even, even that is contradicting what happened in the original Mega Man Tensei, because Nakajima invented it in that, but because it's a different sort of timeline, obviously. But, um, yeah, I, I don't think they're connected in the slightest. Uh, I, I really don't either, and also I think it's kind of... I think it's very heavily hinted at in SMT2 even that Steven's Steven's around still because he, he's he's just that smart where he's he he knows his way around um the multiverse a, a little bit like maybe not specifically that way but uh, I I do know that they they kind of hint that he's been able to like kind of put his own mind and body and such in like AIs and various computers yeah. and stuff like that like 
I would not be surprised if the reason he's around an SMT4 is because he's like, eh, I just dicked around with the terminal system enough until I got it so that I can yeah. be a big factor in the universe. Um, I mean, he worked on it, and he's a neutral representative, first and foremost, so of course he's not going to be an angel. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm just saying, like, he if he, he was one of the people who started the basis of that whole system, so he knows how it works probably better than anybody else. Yeah. Um, I would not be surprised if he has a bit of a guilty conscience about also starting that whole demon thing in smt1 because the first the first few demons came through the uh original, original terminal. terminal right so um i would not be surprised if he's like well fuck uh maybe i should clean up a little bit after causing that whole debacle um so i guess moving on to the second question uh do you think people would hate ken from persona 3 less if the person he was gunning for wasn't shinjiro i'm pretty sure that oh my to... god <laughs> i'm pretty sure that's really yeah um it says i'm pretty sure that trying to kill one of the most popular characters in the game uh, and said character dying partially because of him has um, more to do with it than any th- of Ken's personality traits. Um, yeah. I don't think Ken has that bad of a personality. He's just a kid. I don't yeah, either, but a there's a lot of people that really hate Ken. and Yeah, I know. I don't really get it. I don't get it either. Um, like, Shinjiro is my favorite character in Persona 3, and I still don't get it. <laughs> like, um, the, the, thing, the thing with Ken is, like, he is just a kid, though. And, like, when your parents die, you're going to have a few issues, and you're probably going to want revenge on something yeah especially since that you know, cast parents die yeah, yeah. De- like of course like the entire theme of persona 3 is death getting over death accepting death what to do when someone you love so much dies and etc and so forth all the cast members have had someone who died at some point in their lives so this is pr- like ken's whole vendetta against shinjiro is pretty much him trying to cope with the death of his mother I mean, it's not actually Shinjiro's fault that his mother died. He was just yeah. in, in, in yeah. directly the cause of it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that that's kind of what it comes down to. Is Ken is just very young and he doesn't necessarily know how to deal with it as well as the other cast members that have obviously gone through a little bit more in their lives too, with you know being older and whatnot. Um, and also the, the whole thing that um, it seems really uh, they imply this. I don't know if it's outright stated. It's been forever since I played P three. Uh, Ken is pretty pretty outcasted it seems like at least in terms of having friends before he moves into the dorm just because he is a little bit more smarter than other kids his age and stuff well he's he, yeah he's constantly trying to sort of move above his weight because you know he, yeah. he uses the lance because he's not tall enough he tries to act mature because he's not old enough he and you know even even in the it's sort touched of upon in no. ultimax he he's yeah. he sort of saying like well mitsuru wanted me to go and live a life like a normal kid but now that i'm being dragged into this i might as well go because yeah. it's just like old times again, and I'll be able to fight with my friends and you know do this kind of stuff that he got to do as a kid, but now has to go to try and be more normal. Yeah, um, it's, it's even touched a bit more on uh, Persona Three Portable, the female protagonist, throughout when you do Ken's social link about how he feels about being a child and well, being a kid's a hard time. Yeah. Um. Oh man. Okay. I guess. Um. Third question. Uh. If Dante could ever appear in another game, what game do you think he would fit uh, best in? We all need a little bit more Dante in our lives. And I think Katsu dropped again. Uh, we'll get him back in soon. Um, I don't know, man. Like, Because um... Nocturne was a pretty good fit, I'd say. Like, it was a little weird, but it still fit pretty well. But maybe SMT4? <laughs> Nah, SMT4 is too much about Japan as being Japanese and having various unique issues and sort of about the contrast of the West in Mikado to have a sort of ridiculous character like Dante just suddenly be like, yeah! <laughs> yeah, like, I can't think of any other, though. Like, because DDS would just be weird because I think Dante would be really out of place there. Um fucking strange journey would be weird too because there's just not that many people in general well i guess to be to be fair i guess dante isn't much of a person but yeah i'm having a tough time with that question because, i mean to uh, be fair even dante's portrayal in smt3 is kind of unique among games that he's been in yeah um but you know i'm yeah i, I think if you like had maybe a, a bonus dungeon or something where you sort of just fell into the culpas again or something you, you, you probably work that in yeah something like that um man Not yeah i guess even but... yeah i guess i don't know because I'm, I'm feeling it'd, it'd be it'd have to be one of the main lines i don't know why but that's kind of what i'm thinking about because just yeah it'd be too weird if you showed up in like persona like hey 
<laughs> I don't like that. That'd be way too strange. You're gonna kill some demons. Oh, those are gone now. So um. Oh, uh, which what? Oh, um, <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Virgil. Um, man, I, I, I'm I'm thinking this would be weird, but Rido could possibly just. I'm imagining a Rido Dante sword duel, and it'd look, be really out of place with Dante being all modern and whatnot. But I think that'd be funny. Thing is, though, you know, now now, now that you mention it, I just, I just thought of this, but. They haven't used the the rumor stuff as extensively in any of the games since Persona 2. And they, I mean, they had mentioned it in Persona 4 because that was sort of the whole idea behind the TV thing that, oh, everybody's thinking about this, and so there it is. But, um, you know, the the Kusanahas are still around in the in the Persona world, even if they haven't been in any of the games. Like, they could bring it back for P- Persona 5 if they really wanted to. Yeah, I'm going to add Katsu back in real quick. Um, oh, Katsu's internet. Like, maybe have that still be around, and then somehow after Persona 5 comes out, then you can make Devil Summoner 5. <laughs> there we go. Oh, man. Now, actually, this is a good question, unrelated, but uh, if they make another Devil Summoner, would you like it to be another Rido action RPG, or would you want it to be a, um, like, more similar to Soul Hackers and Devil Summoner 1? Well, I don't think they could effectively do another Devil Summoner Soul Hackers 1 type game just because that's not where the Devil Summoner series has gone. Like sort of each 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 of the subseries has progressively carved its own niche more away from the original SMT style of gameplay. Yeah. Like so sure Devil Survivor 1 is maybe the exception to that because that starts out as a SRPG and has stayed that way for both of the games that they've had. Um but, you know, I think if that's the SRPG subseries and Persona 3 and 4 is the more sort of character-driven um, social RPG series, then I think Devil Summoner is going to have to be distinguished by being the action RPG series. Yeah. And, I mean, even we've had some talk on the podcast of if if they wanted to go a Metal Gear Rising route or something. and I, I really hope not. That, that is just not the kind of game that is... I would I, th- I would be interested by it. Maybe even making a spinoff of a spinoff, but... I mean, I'd be interested to see where it would go, but I think the Devil Summoner series, where where it was best is not that arena. Yeah. Just um, I, I, think, I think mostly it got by on how, how it portrayed story and characters. Like, people often say to say about Rido games that Rido 1 has the better story, but Rido 2 has the better gameplay. Yeah. Uh, but Rido 1 has the better story because of just, I mean, first of all, it was a pretty, pretty uncovered, you know, game um, to, to have in that time period, because most games don't take place then, obviously, and there's <laughs> a lot of unique stuff to talk about. Um, so, you know, you could go from that time period and still make another game about that if you really wanted to. But I think it might be interesting to see um maybe from maybe find out who the fourth family is or um you know go from uh either the uh, what is the, what is the, what is the third family's name besides Rido and Kyoji oh, man i i know it's on the tip of my tongue but i can't quite recall okay the the girls family who who whoever they are um you could do a game about them if you want yeah um, you can you can fi- find out where they are in modern times and go from there you know, there's, there's, there's definitely avenues you could pursue that are not boring and are still, you know, new enough to make a whole new story about them. We haven't had a Mega Ten ARPG in forever since Rido 2 anyway, so... Yeah, it's been six years since then. Yeah. I mean, we need another Devil Summoner in general. Like, we just got Soul Hackers, but that was a re-release, like... I think it, a lot it's, 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 not, it's not a re-release to English speakers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, let's see, okay. Um, I'm actually looking up the... Um, Garen... Garen, right? Garen. Um, Garen. Yeah. Now, if if I mean, if you think about it, it's been um, six years since Persona Four too. But yeah, uh, they've had a lot more content to sort of buffer the time between then and now. Whereas uh, Rido Two was kind of its own thing, and then that was it. Um, I mean, of course, you did have Soul Hacker, so they're not totally ignorant of it, obviously. Because I mean, yeah. even in the even in the Japanese audience, they um, had had a release of soul hackers in a while so if it was going to be even slightly relevant you know you got to keep up with that because i mean if you think about being a fan of that series you know in order to actually play every game prior to the re-release of soul hackers on 3ds you would have had to own either a sega saturn or psp a playstation one um i'm not sure if the if soul hackers also came out on on the saturn at that time but you would you would have to own those and then also own a ps2 
which is difficult, let's just say. Oh, yeah. Uh, now, I mean, if you want to play all four of the Persona games, you just have to own a PSP or, or a Vita, which mm-hmm. is not that hard. Um, but, I, you know, Eternal Punishment Portable came out as recently as 2012. Yeah. So, you know, there's that to think about. So what, what happened to Katsu? Did you just fall out? Uh, yeah, his internet's stingy. Okay, yeah, it's... Okay, he just says finish without me because his internet's been not the best. So, um... Oh. I guess we have two more questions. We we went off a tangent on Devil Summoner okay, releases, okay. but that was that was that was a good talk. So um, we this tends to happens with emails. We just go off. Um, let's see. So the fourth one is um, what uh, what do you see the strange journey protagonist as? Well, I was playing through the game. I started to see him as a guy who just wanted to stop fighting. I imagine that he has spent years fighting in conflicts already, and he's starting to get sick of combat uh, and the stress. And um, Schwartzwelt seems to have the impression as one last assignment for him uh i don't quite recall if there's ever anything in the game that implies that actually though now that i'm thinking no i don't think so um but you know he, i i think you could probably interpret any number of ways i mean it's probably the it's probably the last assignment for everybody on that ship yeah uh, but uh you know i don't think there's enough characterization for him to really say what sort of person he is and if from from what everyone else says about him he's at least a confident leader um you know, he's, uh, I don't know, do, do they say he's handsome? I don't, I don't actually remember, but um, there really isn't that much information about him other than he's a good soldier and he leads well. Yeah, and um, I think I think what's interesting, too, part of, a, part of the draw of Strange Journey, too, is that uh, it's mainline, but you do have the more adult, more mature, a little bit more rational thinking cast there, whereas all the other mainline games, they're high schoolers or at least around that age well um, everybody in mega intensity games starts out thinking rationally it's just by by the end yeah. sort of make a at some point in the story they make a, a broad switch over from hey i'm rationalizing this to hey let's kill all the people in this area like especially jimenez in in, in, in strange germany is like i i was i was really sympathetic to his character up until he uh fused with the um demon <laughs> like I, I like he, he he made a lot of sense even if he was kind of an asshole up until then and he you know was you know, at least reasonable and even he, like zelenin's character changed like really drastically over the course of that game and you know i understand why they had to do that because they were they still had to follow a model at the, at the end of the day but like it, it, i just felt like it was really weird at uh, that that she would eventually go for that because obviously she had the motivation to try and like stop people from dying mm-hmm. but even she, she was a scientist. You know, it was. It's, it's kind of silly to say that. Well, you know, I'm just going to suddenly follow this angel who says I'm going to, you know, make these people think differently. Like that, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> yeah, and um, I think that's a big part of what they did with Strange Journey too, is they wanted to show even the world's best, uh, when they when shit hits the fan and different right. ideologies start to come in, people are still going to take sides. People are still going to argue over stuff like this, and I thought they did that pretty well, at least from what I've experienced sure. in that game. I have to think the only excuse for having done that kind of drastic character change is A, because it, it has to follow the same sort of model as Shimigami Tensei does, but also because the situation was dire enough that they were, you know, willing to believe certain things that they wouldn't have otherwise. Yeah, and um, I guess here's the last question. Uh, how did Katsu and I first meet? Um, Katsu wanted me on for... Um, Katsu is one of the admins for a Persona 4 Arena site called Mayanaka Midnight, and um, he wanted me on because they did little like video logs or vlogs, whatever you want to call them. Uh, and they wanted me on to talk about SMT for SMT Cross Fire Emblem. Then like we were talking late one night, a few weeks later, and then we started this podcast. So that's how that happened. Um, but yeah, I think uh, think that's about it. Speaking of Katsu, rest in peace. Seems like his internet does not want to play well tonight. Um, yeah, but he dropped from a call. <laughs> yeah. Um, R.I.P. in peace, buddy. Um, but can I just I, point out though that he, you said his site was called uh, Mayonaka Midnight? Yeah. You know that's just midnight twice, right? Yeah, I think <laughs> I think there's a thing with that. Um, I would not be surprised. Um, I, I don't know as much about that site as I should. That's his. That's his baby. Um, right. So um, I guess that's about it. Thanks a lot, Frequency, for being on. And yeah, I'll link to uh, stuff below. Hopefully, any 
experienced programmer listening to this or something or someone that knows an experienced programmer could get in touch and maybe maybe get in contact with uh working out a rom hacking project for devil right. summer one so if you or anyone you know knows how psps work uh please give me a call and if you've listened to this far thanks for putting up with my nasally california accent it's all good people listen to my voice already so they, <sighs> they already don't have taste in voices it's okay I'm sure I will receive many vicious comments on the uh, SMTG board and in the comments. So it's all good. So um, yeah, thanks a lot for listening and uh, frequency, man. Good luck for um, just with the project in general. And uh, I want to say thank you because with this fan base, you know, it's still I will say Mega Ten is still kind of a smaller fan base, and uh, I think we need a lot more people like you that are willing to do awesome stuff like this and just help out the rest of the community. Thanks a lot for your work, man, and uh, have a good time. Yeah, let me know when you put the video up because I'll, I'll share it. All right, okay. Yeah, and I think with that, we are going to say our goodbye. So bye, everyone. Thanks for listening. I'm doing the thumbs up, but you can't see it. Like the tiny stars, like the boss, whenever it's earth, you keep on blinking at me. You never turn.